data don't lie. That probably was the first lie about data. <laughs> if some things just are fact, climate change is a fact. You believe we are invaded by migrants, and then I ask you where the migrants are. What we come to understand as a set of truths is a consequence of what can be known at a given moment. Hi, and welcome to the Porto Design Biennale. My name is André Cruz. You are listening to Voices from the Atelier, a series of six podcasts, each dedicated to one alter reality. Truth, dignity, play, memory, dream, and language. I hope that each of these six themes I have selected for our talks will contribute to a better understanding of how, from their different contexts, designers are responding to our current unpredictable times. This first episode is dedicated to truth. What is truth? How many possible truths are there? And how many can coexist in one given space and time? Truth is under increased pressure. Today's societies are faced with a giant question mark. Where are we headed to? Or, as Bruno Latour has put it, where will we land? What will the global geopolitical map look like following the increasing polarization and division of worldviews? Are different individual and perhaps polarizing truths being forged through constant visual communication, flows of targeted information and online bubbles constructed for each and every one of us? How can design reshape access to and notions of truth? In Taiwan, for example, citizens are offered media literacy courses to identify false information. It is perhaps in such initiatives that design can contribute to implement fact-checking. And speaking of facts, what of the idea of scientific evidence as the ultimate form of truth, or of popular political ideologies that question scientific knowledge? According to Eva Kaufman, in her 2018 article published in the New York Times magazine, the past decade has seen a precipitous rise not just in anti-scientific thinking, but in all manner of reactionary obscurantism. From online conspiracy theories to the much-discussed death of expertise, Kaufman gives as an example the negation of global warming, predominantly by American conservative Republicans. Fortunately, we now have at our disposal the exact same tools that allow for the spread of misinformation, which we can and should use to counter this phenomenon. Open data initiatives are paramount and need to be further developed and used by those who are technologically and informationally savvy, like designers usually are. I borrow from Kate Tempest's idea that we are readers as well as writers. We are authors as well as interpreters of texts, of images, of sounds and music, as well as of experiences, of our own as well as others. Stay with me and my two wonderful guests, Susan Shupley, a researcher, documentary filmmaker and artist based in the UK, whose work examines material evidence from war and conflict to environmental disasters and climate change. And also Matteo Moretti, an award-winning designer, lecturer and co-founder of Sheldon Studio. I started by asking them, how can any of us be assessing credible information? What was the process that brought us to where we are today? So the problem is it's about people education. Despite we are super educated, but in the end we are not educated to, to, to think in, in the long term, to approach the things critically. My simplest advice uh, in terms of how we might determine like what's true is like education. <laughs> uh, being as informed as possible and... Um, also, you know, I don't, I'm not, don't use Google search engine as your primary mode of <laughs> vehicle for uh, understanding because all of the d ways in which the, um, these bump algorithms are used to move information up and then, of course, the phenomenon of clickbait, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I mean, sometimes I actually do think like common sense <laughs> has 
uh, vanished. <laughs> the current COVID-19 pandemic has brought us several new realities. One of them was, without a doubt, the aggressive and constant presence of data related to the spread and impact of the disease in the media space. Are we prepared for this excess of information that involves us daily and that has grown exponentially from year to year? We are really overwhelmed, at least in the Western society, obviously, by information. And for a, cert for a certain degree, yes, no, or better, we talk, we are not, we are literated. It's supposed to be that now in the Western society we are able to read and write, but we are not really prepared to, uh, how to say, to deal with media and overwhelm it by, and this information overload. So the new terms emerge like media leader, literacy, graphicacy, that stands for graphically, graphical literacy, because it's not only about the, the huge amount of information, but also how these information are driven. So more visually, more with data. Now, nowadays, for instance, the, 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 um, the pandemics was an incredible example of how we are not prepared, but not only are we as a citizen, but also we as a politician. <laughs> People, obviously, dealing with the pandemics is, is not something that politicians are trained to do. Are trained for so nobody <laughs> never deal with that. But at least in Italy, we had some re, some cases where the, the lack of knowledge in how to read data and, and, w and obviously there are many ways to read data because even the data or at, we 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 are raised on these um, idioms that data don't lie. That probably was the first lie about data <laughs> because it's absolutely. Data, uh, I, there was a statement, I think it was by Churchill, that was like, um, if adequately tortured, data in the end tells what you, what you expect. So it, according to the way you, you, you deal with data, you can tell what you want. And you should be not only able to understand data, but also aware of, about all the pitfalls and all the problems that communication with data brings. And, and, and again, for instance, it's also interesting in the book, Data Feminism by Catherine D'Ignazio that rely on this feminist approach on data. So basically explaining that, yes, data are telling something, but more probably they are not telling other things. Because what you see is exactly what the data is about. But for instance, it's not a new that some years ago, the census wasn't about mapping all the whole population, but only the population that counts. Whenever these kinds of, especially something that's operating at a kind of global scale and where everybody is personally uh, potentially kind of implicated, that produces the kind of conditions whereby um, states under the guise of, you know, protecting our interests uh, can really put, push through these other kinds of agendas. And they're very entangled also with corporate um, management of data as well, of course. Those two things are very closely kind of knit together, right? The kind of, because the states have outsourced their data acquisition oftentimes to other, uh, you know, tech companies, etc. I feel it's really kind of COVID is an alibi that a lot produces this intensification. Yeah, we see that with, you know, it, it maps really uh, nicely on to anti-immigrant rhetoric, the sort of xenophobic uh, kind of perspectives, you know, like to maintain the integrity of the nation state or the border, you know. Um, so once again, in, in, in the UK, we will have a very well vaccinated island. But, you know, there, but the, if we look at what's happening in India, for example, what is our ethical responsibility? Is it just to keep ourselves completely secure in this hermetic bubble that we might want to call the United Kingdom? And, you know, so I think, yeah, border regimes there, you know, I'm sure that there are many people really um, 
tracking this and, and seeing all of the ways in which it maps onto uh, security infrastructure and modes of governance and control um, that are far, in some way, far beyond the immediate purview of healthcare provision, right? It is difficult to approach the topic of truth without touching on the work of Bruno Latour. I asked Matteo Moretti and Susan Shupley to talk to me about the production of facts, but also how the lack of truth was always an ally of colonialism and its violence. So basically the, the philosophical or sociological turn that Latour made was that probably everything can be seen not as a matter of fact, something that it's impossible. So it is like that and it's impossible to have different version of it. But if you look in the long term, probably in the last 2000 years of human history or even more, everything was subject to, to changes. So that even the most, uh, how to say, scientific discovery that in that time seems impossible to, to prove, or yes, they, 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 they were very evident in the end, after 2000 years, we discover, okay, this was just the first step to realize other things. So basically on this very broad view, there's everything can be discussed and renegotiated basically and uh, it's a matter of times so social settings uh, technological discoveries and all the complexity we are involved in so even the concept of family that for instance in italy was something sacred so one man one woman some child now it's everything completely <laughs> under discussion and what is the real family and probably it's one of the biggest debate we have. Oh, okay, now we have the COVID, but probably after the COVID, all the, the, the past issues like the climate change, migration, gender issue, gender equality will return stronger than before. A certain conception of the state of the world is um, often a direct consequence of the mindset that is producing the interpretation, right? And can get it completely kind of wrong. So. The uh, the idea that, uh, and you mentioned uh, uh, the legacies of colonial violence of uh, like, you know, there's, you know, innumerable examples where a certain kind of colonial ideology perceived a you know a group of people as uh, inferior or so-called primitive because of a particular. Uh, uh, obviously bias and racism and ideological positioning that they brought to that encounter such that they could uh, formulate a, and, and made claims, etc., that were completely erroneous. So, um, but, you know, the humanities has spent a great deal of effort in trying to look at the ways in which so many uh, truths or assumptions are actually the consequence of a whole set of enabling conditions, which could include the ways in which resource funding is allocated to one area, etc. And this kind of social construction of facts, which something someone like Bruno Latour spent a lifetime sort of arguing for that, you know, like what we hold as a fact is often a consequence of a whole set of um, agreed upon conventions, you know, like something isn't in and of itself a fact. It needs to be produced as a fact, as a fact or as a truth. So Bruno Latour himself now many years ago found himself in this paradoxical situation where he goes, yeah, I've spent my whole you know, lifetime as a scholar trying to argue for the social construction of facts, but now I just want to, I find myself in a position where I just want to say some things just are fact. Climate change is a fact. I don't want to look at don't want to uh, don't want to argue that that's just a social construction right in a recent text by designers adam torp and lorraine gaman titled power they go as far as stating that fake news are a new form of propaganda that seeks to deny the citizen the information necessary for participation in debate and in doing so it is an act of violence while fake news are not a novelty in the history of humanity, what is new is the means of dissemination. 
particularly the reach and the speed by which media circulate across all latitudes of the globe. This was famously observed and broadly reported in 2016 at the time of Trump's election, or more recently in Lukashenko's Belarus, where the news about grounding a plane as it crossed its airspace on the fake threat of a bomb on board in order to detain a presumed exiled dissident were presented as fake in that country. The increasing circulation of fake news is also associated to the rise of populist movements and as a threat to the processes by which democracy is ensured, leading several countries to put prevention actions in place in order to control this phenomenon. Also, it is another psychological phenomenon that it's called cognitive dissonance. So once you believe we are invaded by migrants, and then I ask you where the migrants are. Ah, they are everywhere. Where? Ah, I don't know exactly, but they are everywhere. <laughs> so you have one reality, but you are not able to understand your reality because you are so immersed in, 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 in a narration that gives you strength because you, you believe in this narration, gives you a lot of safety in, in terms of mental, uh, how to say, Yes, I believe that we are invaded and these are the, the way to, 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 to survive or a lot of security in the end that we don't have. We are in a very unsecure moment, historical moment. So it's very easy to speak to this kind of people providing security with easy solution to biggest problem that are impossible to solve at least in a short time span. The problem, again, it's a problem of awareness because as we you were saying before uh, on this narrative on this narrative about migration uh, we had a lot of politician for instance trump in the united states um, farange in, in in with the brexit again using uh, migration as a hammer to to create consensus in in, in europe in the Euro european election salvini for sure <laughs> But even in Europe, all the race of this uh, xeno xenophobic party, even in France, was about migration. We we will be invaded by migrants, and now migrants are yes, we all are migrants. But apart these um, things, uh, wasn't true because we are still there. Migrants are in Africa. Some of them are here. We are not invaded. Obviously, there are many other things. There are millions in Turkey, millions in Libya suffering in. Uh, in camps, we should talk about this, not about perceived invasion on, on, upon which the, the right-wing party used to, to create consensus about fear. We usually fear what we don't know. I would like to make a project about the European election and then we, we didn't have the time. But it was very curious that the, the majority of votes to, to the right-wing party was in the, this part of the countries where the, the migrants are less. So in the city, for instance, th that are full of migrants, people were more open, probably because they have occasion to get in contact with them. In the small town, in small communities, where even one person more create a strong, uh, uh, how to say, break the, the balance, because com even one migrant creates a lot of panic among the community, probably after two weeks is part of the community <laughs> and it's well accepted. But in the beginning, the fear of somebody from abroad that arrived and then it's black. That is another, probably even the Chinese were more accepted than the African because they are black. Forensic architecture headquartered at Goldsmiths, University of London, is a human rights agency investigating human rights violations, including violence committed by states, police forces, militaries, and corporations. Susan Shupley, currently part of the advisory board of this organization, tells us how, together with artists, architects, and five survivors of Sydney prison, they managed to recreate the interior of the prison itself using the prisoners' sound memories. This work gave strength to Amnesty International's claim that the prison is being used as a site of execution by the Assad regime. When it came to uh, Assad's prison, uh, Amnesty was 
really keen to continue this method, but they said, you know, but we they said that they now had uh, former prisoners and who were relocated in Turkey, and that we would be able to, to talk to them. We, or rather, that forensic architecture would be able to talk, speak with those um, former prisoners. But they said the one problem is that all the prisoners were blindfolded; they couldn't see. They couldn't see the the cells. They couldn't see the context in which they were held for many years. And Lawrence Abu Hamdan was at that um, meeting. And Lawrence, as you probably know, is a is a really well known um, artist who works oftentimes with uh, sonic methodologies. And so, yes, of course, these prisoners couldn't see uh, the situation but they could hear everything and not only could they hear they developed a very very um, uh, very sophisticated in fact very uh, attentive modes of listening and hearing because that was their primary mode of communication with each other was through the acoustic register um, and so the eventual uh, 3D models that were produced of that prison and the conditions of the prison and locating all of the um, inmates, etc. That digital model was produced through the acoustic memories of the survivors. This, this prison was reconstructed entirely from the sounds that they remembered. So that's a really, I think, a fantastic example um, of both of the evolution of of, of the work, but also the ways in which um, forensic architecture has continually had to sort of adapt to new situations and figure out uh, sort of innovative uh, methods of investigation. One of the biggest challenges faced by environmental justice work lies in the irrefutable relationship between cause and effect. In the trace evidence video, Susan Shipley explores the appearance of nuclear evidence from three events. The unearthing of ancient nuclear reactors at the uranium mine site in Oklo, Gabon in 1972, Chernobyl's nuclear disaster, and also Fukushima Daiichi and its impact through the waters of the Pacific Ocean to the west coast of Vancouver Island. So the first one's called geology, um, the one on Chernobyl was called mete meteorology, and the final one was called hydrology. The second one um, I think is important for your listeners because as a practicing artist, um, uh, I wanted to tell the story about um, nuclear evidence in particular, um, but I also what I didn't want to do um, in the case of Chernobyl, I wasn't, I didn't want to go back to the, I didn't want to go to Chernobyl in the Ukraine to shoot this film because, you know, thousands of people have, have gone there, right? It's one of these places of, of sort of dark tourism. And we've seen a lot of those kinds of images, you know, the, the school with the desks and all of this sort of nature reclaiming these kind of spaces. And there's almost a sense of a kind of, it's an industrial ruin, but it, ruin, but it has a certain kind of, I think visually and aesthetically, it's often pictured as a, in a certain, almost has a sort of romanticism in terms of the kind of image production that has, has um, emerged out of, a lot of um, a lot of filming and, and photography at, at Chernobyl. Of course, it's an industrial ruin, but I don't think we should be looking at these um, environmental, uh, well, it's not just environmental. These disasters with it with a kind of like uh, romantic sensibility, um, because you see a lot of images of the peeling paint, the trees, and the that are growing back through the windows of the buildings. And you also have this weird um, sensibility that nature has the ability to repair and heal these sites of extreme contamination. So that wasn't the st that certainly wasn't the story I wanted to tell. I decided I wanted to sort of focus on 
as I said, evidence. Like, where were, was evidence of the event? Well, in fact, at the time, so 1986, you know, the Soviet Union um, had basically censored, but certainly had not publicly admitted that anything had happened at Chernobyl. There was a kind of media blackout. Um, and actually a significant, like, willful refusal. Um, but evidence for Chernobyl um, does appear, but it appears in Sweden, because these radioactive contaminants, uh, they're atmospheric, right? And they're moving through, they're moving like a big cloud of radioactive pollutants, you know, across Belarus, across Poland, into Scandinavia. Scandinavia has a lot of, uh, has a, n a fair number of nuclear energy uh, plants, and they all have, um, you know, very comprehensive detectors to monitor whether any, there's any kind of leakage from the plants. So what was happening at Forsmark in Sweden is workers that were going to work, uh, entering the plant, were setting off these detectors, and this started to happen like over and over again. So people from the outside, as they're moving into the Forshmark nuclear power plant, are setting up the detectors and they're going like, what is happening? You know, and immediately there's a kind of massive sort of like alarm goes off in the entire plant. Every, you know, everybody's evacuated. They're looking for all the kind of the sources of this radioactive contamination. Um, and, you know, over the course of the day, they, real, they, they come to the realization, well, it's actually not our, our plant. The, you know, the chemistry of this radioactive isotope was different than the ones produced by their own um, power plants. Um, and so they realized it had to be coming from somewhere else, and it had to be coming from outside of Scandinavia. And so, of course, when they start plotting all of the locations of nuclear power plants that would be, let's say, in proximity to Sweden, you immediately um, assumed that it was probably coming from somewhere in the Soviet Union. They actually thought it was coming much closer, like to a plant that was much closer to Sweden because of the high degree of radioactive contamination. It was ex very, very extreme, and those high levels suggest that it was coming not from not so far away. It actually turns out, of course, as we all know, that it's coming from Chernobyl. And so it was like the, the release of contaminants was massive and, you know, far more contaminating than, say, Fukushima many years later. But this evidence for this accident, it happens in Sweden. And it's only 19 days later that the former Soviet Union finally admits that something dreadful has happened has gone wrong and so with that chapter I really tried to argue that the sort of evidence for the event was highly delocalized and the sort of most compelling evidence wasn't sure it would be at the site but the site was actually small in terms of the number of people involved but the where the evidence goes public is in Sweden and you know, around the world, they start uh, uh, tracking the uh, tracking radioactive isotopes. Um, an American satellite takes images of a fire at Chernobyl. So they start the pieces are starting to be put together over this period of almost three weeks. The whole time, uh, you know, Soviet diplomacy is is categorically denying that anything has happened in the Soviet Union. Why this is really important um, for the Trace Evidence Trilogy, because really what I was trying to also tell was these stories of environmental contamination. So I wanted to tell the story of these, uh, of, the, of nuclear evidence to, to, to at least highlight one counterexample where the, where you could actually link the event evidence to the event very directly, despite the fact that five years had gone by, you know, so these are kind of like, uh, they're examples that in some way make a counterclaim to the ways in which um, environmental pollutants are often sort of viewed as 
uh, extremely difficult to connect the perpetrator to the kind of consequence of their sort of actions. So this is, this in some way was a, um, allowed me to say, well, in fact, under certain conditions, we can actually uh, connect the dots and we can consequently uh, demand certain kinds of, uh, uh, we might want to demand certain kinds of accountability for the, or um, for those kinds of um, actions. Matteo Moretti's brilliant work is a good demonstration of how design can help us better understand the world around us. The Global Climate Change Project is a good example of information accessible to everyone, for everyone, but also in the way it makes use of digital commons and open data. So the main, the main contribution of our project, Global Climate Change, is that thanks to several interaction design approaches, the project builds a narration about the reader's places. So instead of overwhelming, because as we were saying before, we are overwhelmed by information. Information, also visual information, like picture of the polar bear that is dying in a in, a, in the melting ice. But given this, this, this panorama, we are really saturated by information. And usually we tend not to read information that we don't care or about global phenomenon. And yes, we know that there are there is many global phenomena, but in the moment global phenomena are not really touching us. We don't care on a general level. So we decided instead of uh, having this um, the classical climate visualization provides an European the map of the Europe with countries in different color. And again, yes, you living in Portugal. I'm living in Italy. We look at our country color, but we decided instead of having something quite unusual. So visualizing all the small dots, one for each municipality, with the idea of providing, first of all, a very granular visualization. So where you can also locate the, the city where you grew up or the small town where you had the first kiss uh, of your life. So good memory. So the idea is to provide, obviously you are free to explore, but cr- uh, providing an occasion to search for places that you care. So when you care some, something about, you are more open to read. So and as you, once you find, you spot your place, then you, you read about it. And so you read all the, the, the chart on how the temperature is changing. And obviously the, the, fi- the, the final of the story is very sad. Many of the places we have in, in the project are, are um, witness a strong climate change. So we decided to close every place story with this informative picture that is ready to be shared on social networks. So as soon as the reader copy the link and share on, on Facebook, the project is represented online with this picture that reports the, um, the name of the city and um, the increase in the last 40 years instead of the classical thumbnail. Uh, we are not able to, to solve the problem, but at least we can do something for the planet or at least for your town. So please share this picture among your, among your network, among people that also love this town in a way to raise awareness at least. In, in this, in this, I think there are many things interesting in this project because it's turning the information into a common and uh, using data visualization to return each place climate that has to, to main um, good things. One is, uh, as I said before, that everybody can spot his own or her own town. And the other one is that you can also spot some red dots that are alone. Like many are in Portugal. What the data are telling is that the temperature is higher in that spot, in that place, but we don't know why. Yeah, could be about uh, the amount of concrete cement could be about uh, pollution, human density, geographical uh, conformation. So it's on, on the mountain or it's close to a lake. We don't know. So we have the data, but yes, what's behind the data? And then we can re- restart the discussion <laughs> since the beginning. Probably the tendency that adult humans have to feel more sophisticated than other beings 
prevents the truth from having a simpler presence among us. There is an old French saying that goes something like, children and fools tell the truth. Are we in time, as citizens, to recover the beauty that curiosity makes possible? Could sharing, the idea of working together, different people from different areas, contribute to a more informed society?